Thank you very much indeed, Peter, for that kind introduction. And of course, it's also a great honor uh, to be selected by the Nobel Committee for Chemistry and the Royal Swedish Academy to, to share with Jacques and uh, Joachim this year's 2017 uh, Nobel Prize in Chemistry. But I wanted to begin by saying that the three of us are really representatives of what's now become quite a, a closely knit and uh, well-organized field uh, with uh, a, a phenomenal growth rate. So I'd like to start by showing the first slide, which is from the first three-dimensional electron microscopy annual uh, Gordon conference that was organized in 1985 by the two people in the yellow circles, Nigel Unwin and Hua Chu. And so they had the idea this field was going to grow and inaugurated this meeting, which is now held every year. And I think you can see in the red circles that uh, Jacques, Joachim and I are clustered around, being as close as possible to Nigel and Hua. But there are other people in, in the... Uh, and this is about 100 people where, where the field was starting. Uh, there's a few more who, who weren't at the meeting, but I particularly wanted to point out because uh, the group of Bob Glazer, uh, Ken Taylor, and Ken Downing, they were doing low temperature electron microscopy, cryo microscopy, before uh, the, those of us who are here today. So they were early uh, adopters of that idea. And then, because I'm the first speaker, I wanted to show also a kind of overview of, so that you know uh, what is electron cryo microscopy, which we call cryo-EM for short. And it comes in many different flavors because once you have a good electron cryo microscope, you can put all sorts of different specimens into it. And this slide sort of summarizes a variety of the things that have been studied and have been quite uh, informative. So on the left is uh, a field of view uh, showing amorphous ice with ribosomes embedded in it. This is single particles without symmetry. And this is from uh, work that uh, you will hear more about from Joachim Frank. And this was their state of play in roughly the year 2000 from a review that Tim Baker and I wrote. So single particles without symmetry, single particles with symmetry. This is hepatitis B virus cores from Bettina Butcher's work in 1997. This was the first structure that went below nanometer, below 10 angstrom resolution. And then the third panel is uh, helical arrangements of, of biomolecules. So this is the thin filaments in muscle decorated with uh, subunits of myosin from the work of Ron Milliken. The blue is actin, the green is tropomyosin, and the different colors, pink, orange, uh, and yellow are the different uh, domains of the myosin that's involved in muscle contractility. This is relatively low resolution. All of these are fairly low resolution. But on the right is uh, the, the 2D crystals that I'll talk about at the, at the beginning of, of my own part of the talk. And this was the second uh, high resolution structure determined by cryo-EM by Werner Kuhlbrandt and uh, with collaboration with Fujiyoshi in Japan in, in, uh, in 1994 and shows a 2D crystal at higher resolution because the 2D crystals were easier to start with, which is how I'll start. So that is a range of specimens giving you a kind of overview. The structures here are at about six times bigger magnification than the images at the top. But you can see, and it's, this is, so this is much easier to understand than uh, the gravitational waves and the black holes. You just take images of the molecules, you can see them, and then in the computer, you calculate the structure. So, uh, you know, anyone can do this kind of work. <laughs> so then I want to jump forward. And this is this year's Gordon Conference. So this is now uh, 32 years later. It's a, it's a bigger group, more highly selected. And I've, you see some of the faces, Bob Glazer and, and uh, Joachim, and myself. But I've outlined in yellow... Uh, some of the people who more recently have made very important contributions in terms of developing all the computer programs that has made it so easy and so uh, popular amongst uh, newcomers who don't know so much about it. So Fred Sigworth was one of the original maxim maximum likelihood, uh, Charles Cherez, uh, 
Nico Grigoriev, Marin van Heel, who'd worked with Joachim at one point, and, and Carazzo from Spain. And then two other people in the pale blue, uh, Bridget Carricker and Helen Sable, who in the USA and in Europe have been very important in running courses and educating people, although they also did individual work in the past. So that gives you a little bit of an, an overview of the community and how the closely knit sort of brother and sisterhood of CryUM has adopted its own sort of culture and identity, and that's very important. And so we are only the, the tip of the iceberg, if you like, uh, in this cryo area. And then to give you an idea of where we are now, this is the growth in the depositions of high resolution atomic coordinates in the protein data bank, which traditionally had only coordinates deposited from X ray crystallography and nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. And you see, back in the, in the 1990s and so on, there were invisible numbers of structures. But in the last five years, there's been a great growth. And it looks like this year, we'll end up with about 700 new structures deposited in this uh, protein data bank. More maps. And, and, and we then have, a, a, we have the Gordon conferences. There's a 3D EM mailing list, which didn't exist until 1995, started by Ross Smith. But when that first Gordon conference started, we were probably about 100 or 150 people. Now there are 3,000 people who subscribe to that mailing list. So that gives you a, an idea of the field and the importance of the community. So now I'd just like to, I'm going to do three things in this talk. So uh, tell you how I got involved in being converted by meeting Nigel Unwin from an X-ray crystallographer to an electron microscopy enthusiast. And then how we work together to get a low resolution structure of a membrane protein bacteriodopsin, then a high resolution structure. And then uh, how m our own efforts switched from being electron crystallography into single particle EM, and which has been the, the, uh, the methodology that's made the method really popular. So going back now, to about, in my case, 1971 or 72, uh, I heard a talk by Walter Stichinius in San Francisco. This is the first time he talked about it. He had discovered in a bacterium, halobacteria, these uh, membrane areas, they, you can see striations, these are little two-dimensional crystals, one molecule thick. And with uh, backing and support from uh, Don Engelman and Tom Stites at Yale, we phoned up Stichinius and got some samples of these bacteria, grew them up, and then um, purified these membranes. And each one of these is a little single crystal, maybe 100 molecules or 200 across, so 20 or 30,000 of these identical protein molecules in this 2D crystal. And my original plan had been to uh, dissolve them in detergent, make 3D crystals, or analyze the 2D pattern, this is an X-ray powder pattern from stacks, um, pellets of those same membranes that you saw in single uh, sheets. And so there are lots of spots. You can see they go out. This would be the one, the first spot, second, third, and so on. And this is about seven angstrom resolution. They're all very strong, but you can see them all going out, and you can index them right, out, right the way out to three or four angstrom resolution. So that showed that these 2D crystals were really highly ordered and very suitable for structural analysis. And at that point, I had the great good fortune to meet Nigel Unwin, who had been giving a talk about electron microscopy using negative stain. But in that talk, it was clear he was thinking about how the images would also contain inside the stain the images of the proteins that were being encased in it. So we worked together for uh, two or three years doing on these little patches, that would be one of these crystals, electron diffraction, and these spots are the diffraction spots from the, the lattice of molecules in the crystal, and images that could then be analyzed either in the computer or by optical diffraction to give you the amplitudes and phases of the Fourier components that describe the distribution of matter in the crystals. And when we, we only saw the spots and we had numbers, we wrote them on a sheet of paper, and then to our great delight, when we submitted these amplitudes and phases to the computer and then went down to the big computer in Cambridge University, we got this map, which was surprisingly informative and very beautiful, we thought. The, the plotter, which was the only accurate plotter in all of Cambridge at the time, had three color pens, the red, green, and the blue, 
so the red, green, and the black, and it showed in projection three of these protein molecules with big peaks 10 angstroms apart. And, and we'd already suspected from the X-ray pattern that there were alpha helices. This is the Pauling Corey alpha helix from the model building that they did in the 1950s and which had been discovered in myoglobin and hemoglobin. But here we now have uh, these uh, alpha helices uh, pointing towards us in a top view of the membrane. So then uh, we continued, tilted the specimens and went into 3D, got these 3D maps that are plotted on sheets of perspex with hand-drawn. Um, the, the, the computer plotter couldn't do plotting on perspex sheets, so these had to be hand-drawn from computer plots. And then uh, looking at it sideways, we built this uh, balsa wood model in 3D, which showed that not only the four uh, alpha helices that could be seen end on in the projection, but with slight tilts, there were seven transmembrane helices. And this was the first um, real strong and hard knowledge about the structure of membrane proteins. 1975, um, we were at that point uh, stuck in terms of uh, knowing that the uh, crystals were better ordered, but not knowing how to, to proceed. And then we tried various things, but in the interim, Hartmut Mikkel, who had been also working on bacterial opsin, managed to crystallize another membrane protein. So in the end, the first high-resolution membrane structure was the reaction centers that uh, Hartmut Mikkel and his colleagues from Martinsried were given the Chemistry Nobel Prize in 1988, which was before we managed to do any better with this. So then we went on and um, tried to go from seven angstroms to a higher resolution where you could see the chemistry, the amino acids and the side chains, and that needed a couple of things. It needed higher resolution electron diffraction patterns, and all the work I've shown you up to now was done with specimens at room temperature, where the water that normally surrounds the, the, the protein, the, the membranes, had been replaced by a sugar solution, by glucose. But now we had uh, cold stages in Cambridge that we could take uh, electron diffraction patterns on film initially, and this one was later with the development of electronic detectors. But uh, our microscopes in Cambridge were not capable of doing high resolution imaging of cryo specimens. And, and what encouraged us was this paper from Hua Chu, the same person who uh, chaired the very first uh, cryo -EM, uh, 3D EM Gordon conference. He had worked with Fritz Zemlin in Berlin, who had a very uh, high-performance prototype microscope that had been made by the Siemens company, liquid helium lens, a liquid helium stage, and he took pictures of this two-dimensional, slightly thin 3D crystal of crotoxin, a structure that we still don't know to this day, but he showed images of crystals with diffraction spots from the images that went beyond four angstroms to 3.9, just the resolution that we were looking for. So this and the uh, existence of the electron diffraction patterns with cryo uh, convinced us that we should make a major effort then uh, to, d to get into high resolution uh, electron cryomicroscopy with the idea of determining the structure of this membrane protein. But on, in, in doing that, we did try other things for many years. And so on this slide, in red is what worked, and in these other three panels are other ideas that we tried. So uh, Tom Seska, David Agard, and Joyce Baldwin tried, this was our idea to bring the methods of X-ray crystallography into uh, electron crystallography, but they, weren't, they just weren't powerful enough. The heavy atoms don't scatter as much in electrons and so on. This was the idea of using heavy atom derivatives. We found the heavy atoms, but the phasing power was not enough. We tried model building. We knew where the helices were, so you, in principle you could search for the location. It wasn't powerful enough, and we tried molecular replacement with more than one crystal form. It worked slightly, but again, not powerful enough. What worked in the end was to take images, just like you saw for crotoxin from Hua Chu's work in Berlin, uh, and then also uh, we began, actually, with a one-week trip to uh, Jacques Dubochet's lab, who was in EMBL at that time, and he'll tell you about this later. And Jean Le Paul worked for a week on a really 
very difficult to use microscope, I think, which they dismantled after. But we did get one image, the very first high resolution image, which then gave us further encouragement. And then visiting Bert, this is 1984, 1985, uh, following in Wa Chu's footsteps, uh, we went to, to Berlin, Fritz Semlin, Eric Beckman, uh, worked for many years, five or six years, taking images, making the microscope better. And then in parallel, Bob Glazer, who had been visiting us, uh, persuaded Ken Downing also to take pictures. So in the end, we had contributions from three different labs. And we also tried in Cambridge, but we never got images as good as these. These were all prototype, non-commercial, not available. And of course, after it worked, we then tried to put pressure on the microscope manufacturers to, to de develop the commercial versions, which we, is what we now use. In parallel with the practical problem of getting really good high-resolution images, there were a number of technical things that I won't go into, but particularly uh, finding out that beam tilt was one of the critical problems that we hadn't realized, and now figuring out a way in tilted specimens to correct for the different height, the different defocus. But after doing that, we ended up with improved maps, so ev eventually, from 1975 to 19, uh, 15 years worth of various uh, problems, I don't think it cost nearly so much as the Gravity Wave project. Uh, but we went from, this is the same map I showed you with the Balsa Wood model, uh, seven angstrom resolution in 1975, slightly better by molecular replacement. These features turned out to be real, although we weren't sure at the time. And then the first 50 images gave us a map with more better resolved features, and eventually with about 70, we got a map where you can see s key features sticking out from the alpha helices, and at higher magnification, they looked like this, and when we then tried to interpret that map using the amino acid sequence from Ofchenikov and Karana's lab, which by then had been determined by biochemistry, we found that you could interpret the map and see phenylalanine, tyrosine, uh, tryptophan, another tyrosine, and then the retinal, the color of the membranes, they were purple, we could see all of these structures and built a complete atomic model of the bacteria drops. And that was about 1990, and it was the first high-resolution structure where you could use electron microscopy to determine the structures. So then we went on and did other work. Uh, in the early 1990s, Nico Grigoriev refined the structure, SRIRAM came, we did lots of kinetics, trapping intermediates and so on. But at that time, I also got involved in a, a review for an X-ray microscope and ended up writing a review comparing the radiation damage from neutrons, X-rays and electrons. And I then became completely convinced that the EM method was definitely the way to go and had an enormous untapped potential. So we switched our, our effort from working on electron crystallography with crystals, you still have to make crystals, whether it's in 2D or 3D, to working on single particles and, and trying to uh, assist the method in going from the relatively low resolution to try to go to a higher resolution. And of course, in this respect, and Jacques will tell you about this in due course, uh, Jacques' group at EMBL had been exploring the behavior of water when you froze it, and they had a variety of gravity-driven or elastic band-driven freezing apparatuses. And I thought, I'd just since I'm speaking first, I should give you a little outline of it. This is the, the cryo-EM grid preparation method that Mark Adrian, Alistair McDowell, who's here, and Jacques developed in the early 1980s. The idea is you take grids that have got holy carbon films on it. This says holy carbon film. Uh, you, you take them one at a time in a pair of forceps, you apply a drop of your solution with your protein of choice or your ribosome or whatever, you blot it on a piece of filter paper and then you plunge it uh, one or two meters per second into liquid ethane, which was Alistair's idea. Occasionally when we were working on bacteria, we also flashed it with light. But when you did that, you get images, beautiful images, where you see the amorphous ice. This was a specimen that Richard Perham uh, gave us uh, Peter Rosenthal made the specimen. Vinoth Kumar took this image quite recently with the new detectors. You can see the particles. You can see their orientation. Uh, it's clear without doing any further computation that it's really powerful. And then this is the very first hepatitis B virus core work that came from Tony Crowther's group done by Bettina Botcher. And uh, Nikolai Kisilev had brought from Riga in Latvia a specimen early on in 1994 and using older microscopes, 
uh, not such bright sources, not very coherent. They got a first 30 angstrom resolution cryo EM structure in 1994. And then we bought a 200 higher voltage field emission gun, brighter source microscope, which Bettina used with specimens that Sam Wynn had made in Tony's computer program. And they got this then first structure from single particle work to go below 10 angstroms. We called it uh, sub nanometer structure. And of course, now we're now uh, 20 years further on. Uh, this was a, a recent paper published from Hong Cho's group at UCLA. Uh, higher voltage, brighter microscope, much more stable, but still all of these are pictures taken on film. And they got a 3.5 angstrom resolution structure. You can see uh, these are alpha helices, a bundle of four alpha helices. You can see the side chains and so on. So the, the microscopes, due to pressure from the academic researchers, but response by the microscope countries produced much better data. So then the, the thing that's kicked the, the field off in the last few years, these new detectors came in. Previously, we were using film. There are three companies that now make detectors. They're now better than this. They're now up here. This would be a perfect detector at the top. Using these <coughs> detectors, I'm going to show you just two uh, structures. One of them is beta galactosidase, which I think was the structure that Peter had in his introductory slide. Uh, this is a, a half a megadalton structure. It's the LAC-Z, the very first operon discovered in the early stages of understanding um, gene expression. And we had adopted this in 1997 when Sriram Subramanian and Jacqueline Milne were there uh, learning and deciding to get into cryo-EM. And this was the first, we didn't believe this structure in 2005 low resolution. This was the first time we believed it. And this was done on film. And we had, by then, we had new analytical methods, tilt pairs and so on, that proved that this was correct. But as soon as the new detectors came in here, we had higher resolution. And then with new programs such as rely on from Shaw Shared, the same data gave us much higher resolution. So you could resolve then the strands of the polypeptide in the beta sheets. And then Sriram, who had by then uh, an independent group at NIH worked much harder on this, turned the magnification up, collected better data, and has now a 2.2 angstrom data uh, structure. Um, and I believe now this is now better than two angstroms from uh, subsequent work. And then a second one I wanted to show you is mitochondrial complex one, which again, uh, Nico Grigoriev had worked on back in the late 1990s uh, with film and got to about 20 angstrom resolution. Recently, um, uh, Judy Hurst from another MRC unit brought a sample across, and Vinoth Kumar started to take it. This is one of his pictures. This is a one megadalton complex with 45 different proteins in it, and it has no symmetry. You can see it has all sorts of different views. When you uh, record images and process them, you get a map like this in 3D, contoured at one level or at a higher level, and you can see the eight iron sulfur uh, complexes where electrons are fed in from NADH come down into the membrane into uh, quinone and involved in uh, proton transport and then in the membrane there are 76 transmembrane helices and this is about five angstrom resolution so you rather similar to the bacteria adopts an early map at room temperature so you can see the general structure of the of the protein but not the detailed chemistry for which you need higher resolution uh, and then at a, at a lower contour level still, you see the band of lipid and detergent that sounds, surrounds this membrane in the in protein. But uh, Vinoth Jai Penju, who had pre prepared the protein in Judy Hurst's group, went on and improved it until they eventually got a, a model with all 45 polypeptides identified and largely built, although there was some polyalanine, uh, giving you a complete uh, atomic model for the, the structure. And in blue, in the background, are the core subunits that uh, a, a, a bacterial homologue of this mitochondrial membrane protein involved in proton uh, transport, coupling to uh, oxidative phosphorylation. Um, the blue is a bacterial homologue that Leo Sasanoff's group had determined earlier by X-ray crystallography. So that's uh, a kind of complete summary from early stage bacterial adoption to higher resolution and then switching the the approach of cryo-EM into the single particle area. And I just want to finish then with one slide. And this is from recent work that in the last year, uh, Chris Russo and I have been doing, and Chris is, is in the audience here. And the idea is, where are we now? Uh, so we are now, and so what this is, 
This tells you the amount of information in images that you get with the new microscopes and the new detectors. And, and this is the exposure that you're giving it, five electrons per square angstrom, then 10 and 15. And radiation damage eventually kills the structure. You're turning it into a, a cinder, a carbon, carbonaceous fragment of what was once a beautiful protein. Um, so this is what we, ob what we observe when we analyze the data. But what we know we ought to observe if all the remaining problems that exist which are not nearly so profound as the problems in getting gravitational waves to go forward. Um, the red is where we are hoping to be, and then there are a number of uh, factors that explain, we think, uh, why we don't do as well as we should in theory. And the idea now, for the next year or two, is to try to address all of these problems, but the main one being in this blue area, is beam-induced specimen motion from the radiation damage or from releasing stresses that are as a result of the freezing in the first place. And then when we do that, we think you'll be able to do all the things I showed you, lots more, uh, more than a 1,000 structures per year and so on, and it will be less work and more high resolution and so on. So with that, I wanted to finish by saying that, uh, of course, quite a number of people have been involved, and I've worked with them personally, but the main one at the beginning, which which basically converted me from an X-ray crystallographer to an electron microscopist. And I think there was a slight um, uh, action and reaction because after we had worked together on bacteria ops, Nigel also changed, still doing electron microscopy, but doing it on membrane proteins as well. So it was a, an important uh, branching of our potential career paths for both of us. And then we had this 15-year gap where we had to work on a lot of different methods. And in Cambridge, Joyce Baldwin, Tom Seskin, and David Agard were the ones who were pushing it. But uh, Bob Glazer and Ken Downing uh, were important in taking pictures, but particularly Fritz Zemlin and Eric worked very hard for many years. And then we had this one week with, with Jacques and Jean Le Paul in the early stages. That, so that was the high resolution group. And then recently, we've been involved in a lot of the attempts to improve the methodology through detector development and microscope technical developments. And these are the people, uh, Wazi, Greg, and Shausha, who's here from Cambridge, and the two people from Rutherford Appleton, Science Technology Facility Council near Oxford, who have spent 15 years or so developing one of the three types of detector that you can now buy from the market. And then more recently, when we switched into single particle work, I mentioned uh, most of these, not John Rubenstein, who worked on one of the uh, different type of uh, ATPA's uh, rotary motor, and Peter Rosenthal, who prepared one of the specimens that I showed you before. And then the early, the, the, the most recent work in all of the biological structures, like complex one, came from Vinoth Kumar, who has now just opened a new cryoam facility in Bangalore in India. And then finally, in the last year, Chris Roos and I have been trying to address and solve the remaining problems for the future. And then I should just finish by saying that most of the work, obviously the people from other labs were funded by other agencies, but most of this was funded by the Medical Research Council, which has always had, since the time of Brutz and Kendrew, uh, a, a, a clear mandate to do long-term support for projects t that take longer than uh, typical projects take. So with that, thank you very much. Yeah.